uh, all uh, for excellent uh, presentations. I'm Dean Clancy, uh, Vice President of Repeal and Replace at Freedom Works, um, a uh, grassroots national. Oh, well, thank you. Indeed. Dean Clancy, this is the guy. I'm an artist He's gone in spare blind. time. But um, no, we're a grassroots national uh, organization, a million members committed to uh, 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 lower taxes, less government, and more freedom. And uh, if I have a question for, for Doug. Clearly, the, uh, the, the uh, premium subsidies and the Medicare, Medicaid expansion are huge pots of cash from a, a budget perspective almost $900 billion from 2014 to 2019. Um, doc fix is going to get done somehow, and in a new Congress uh, that's more committed to fiscal prudence, there's going to be a lot of pressure to pay for it. Um, is it possible to tap into those pots of cash to delay or postpone or reduce uh, the premium subsidies, the Medicaid expansion? Will that work under the budgeting rules? Is there a timing mis mismatch, for example? So it will work to a degree. There's no question. Uh, if you think about the simplest version of it, you could delay the implementation of, of exchange subsidies and Medicaid expansions by a year. So go from 2014 to 2015, you would pick up as savings one year's worth of those subsidies, and you could take that, which would be a mandatory spending saving, and funnel it directly into a doc fix, for example. Net effect is zero on spending, and if you just keep repeating that game, you never do the insurance subsidies. You actually take the Medicare savings and put them into Medicare where they belong, and that probably should have been where the reform was to begin with. But that's an effective budgetary strategy. Thank you. Joe, while we're waiting for our next question, do you have any thoughts to add to what the... Uh, well, it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I'm Jeff Ferguson. I'm also a resident of the state of Maryland. Embedded in the <laughs> embedded in the health bill is an item that's been rarely discussed, and that is a three and a half percent tax on real estate transactions on the sale of your home that would occur after January 1, 2013. So let's play this out. Being a resident of the state of Maryland, if I sell my home after that date, I pay a 6% real estate commission, I pay a 1.5% transfer fee tax to the state of Maryland, and now a 3.5% sales tax on the sale of my home, which would mean I pay 5% to the government, governmental agencies who've done nothing to help in the sale of my home other than to tax me for having a home. So this bill not only, as we've heard this morning, has the opportunity to tank the medical industry, but also further depress the real estate industry. So do you have a How do we go about question? fixing this? So, th this, is, this is real simple. As part of the financing of the bill, there's a so-called Medicare tax, which is a, a surtax on uh, investment income, including capital gains from sales of homes. And uh, uh, you should be very clear that this has nothing to do with Medicare, because um, estates are liable for this tax, and they dead people don't use much Medicare, so it can't really be linked to Medicare usage in any deep way. Um, it's just a, a, a surtax on high-income people and on their investment income. Uh, it applies uh, to any kind of uh, investment income you might have if you're above $250,000. And so uh, the only way to, to deal with this is as part of tax reform and to make sure that we actually generate uh, a tax system that finances the government does so in an economically rational fashion. And uh, if you think health care reform is hard, try tax reform. Can I just add, too, on, on the tax point, I, mean, I think Joe's slide shows it nicely that they pay for it through cuts to Medicare and increases in taxes. Now, these taxes are not tagged to individuals. They're tagged right. to products and tagged to insurance products, pharmaceuticals. So it, on the appearance, looks to the American people that, no, this isn't going to be on me. But we all know that those taxes get funneled through in higher costs to everyday American consumers, regardless of your income. Last question. What, what I've heard so far, instead, my name is Hans Keithley, what I've heard so far is a lot of procedural talk about repealing, but I still haven't heard much about the, the essence of the problem, which is trying to bend the cost curve down. I've, I think I got from your remarks that maybe if the states experiment, something good will, will happen out of all that, but it's sort of a hope. <coughs> My sense is this argument is just going to be perceived as squabbling between left and right, 
unless there's some really good notion that comes out of this talk about how to bend the, this, this uh, uh, cost curve down. So I'd appreciate your comments on that. <clears throat> well, the good news is that the, the three uh, deficit or, or debt commissions that are floating around the President's, uh, the uh, Rivlin de Medici, uh, and uh, well, I guess there's two, and then, and then Paul Ryan is kind of his own commission, have all basically said the same thing, which is if you accept the reality that there are resource constraints, even in the health sector, uh, and you change the way we subsidize health insurance or health spending so that that resource constraint is actually recognized, uh, uh, then you have a chance of bending the cost curve because then you'll get the attention not only of us patients, but you'll also get atten the attention of providers. Uh, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, you know, is, is the most clear on this in his Roadmap to America. He says uh, convert the Medicare, Medicare program uh, to a fixed subsidy with some adjustments for state of health and, and uh, on income, but basically for an individual, a fixed subsidy every year that grows at uh, GDP plus 1%. Uh, that's a lot slower than the current rate of growth of Medicare, uh, and it's a lot slower than Medicare will, uh, Medicare spending will undoubtedly grow uh, in the future. So, so uh, you know, is that easy to do? Are there steps that you could take? Sure. There are a lot of complicated things you can do to ease yourself into that. Uh, but essentially, uh, the answer is that you have to accept the reality that I, most, I think most sensible people do, regardless of political party, that you can't simply continue to spend at this rate. I think Joe said it exactly right. I just want to make the, your point more clearly, this is going to be a debate between the left and the right, or between the sensible people and, and the far left, because everyone believes that in the end, health care is so important that you must recognize the budget constraint and spend that money wisely, except those who fashioned this bill, who say you may have as much as you want and pay at most 50 cents on the dollar for it. That's never going to work. Maybe if they had started with the government programs that they already had that already are skyrocketing, as Joe said, maybe that could have been a good place to start the reform debate or hopefully start the reform debate in the next cycle. If, if I can add. Just quickly. This is a variant of the argument that you can starve the beast, which, which, which doesn't really work. No, it's, it's turning down the amount of payment <coughs> and hoping that something good will happen out of that. Oh, no. My no question is, how do you actually make the cost go down? The question, how do you actually make the cost go down? How do you make the cost we go down? We need another conference for this. <laughs> just, a quick, just a quick thought. The word cost implies to virtually everybody that you must spend the money. No. How do you make the spending go down? Not how do you make the cost go down. If you change your outlook you, uh, as to what is a absolutely necessary, then you begin to realize that, well, maybe we're, do maybe we're not uh, uh, organizing the health system the right way. Uh, my apocryphal story about my doctor and his MRI machine, which actually he doesn't have one, but most doctors do. He's behind the times. Uh, you know, why does he have that? Well, mostly because not just Medicare, but also private insurance has essentially indemnified that, that investment. And once you've made the investment, then you're going to use it. Uh, there are reports every day uh, indicating uh, that there's incredible overuse of health services of all sorts, not just high-tech services, not just drugs. Why? It's because of the structure of payment in the Medicare program, which is mimicked by private insurance. So we could get into a long and complicated discussion about payment. I've got some ideas for you. <laughs> uh, we clearly have a room for another conference here. Thank you. I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank especially the members of the American Legislative Exchange Council that are, who are here. Thank you, Leader Stevens, Senator Lindquist, for joining us. And thanks to our panel and to our